Welcome to the Nurture Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Denise Kagan, president of the DCA Virtual Business Support. At DCA, we believe in small businesses and the families they support. Learn more at dcavirtual.com. Today's guest has sold over $40 million of products globally. Welcome to the show, Ryan Margolin from ProHair Labs. Thanks for having me, Denise. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, I look forward to the chat. I am looking forward to it too. I very much abbreviated your bio because there's lots of cool things in here that I want to ask you about instead of just spewing it out there. But first, tell me just a little bit about yourself. Yes, look, I'm, I live in Ireland. Myself and my wife decided it's where we uh, wanted to reside in about 2011. I was born in the States, in New Jersey, lived most of it up to my teenage life in Florida. And um, a Jersey I, boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, when I moved to Ireland, because my mother's Irish when I was 14, finished school, traveled a bit, met my wife, uh, we had some kids. And uh, we're we're here now. So that's the kind of bird's eye view, really simple. And from there, we 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 just focused in on um, enjoying life, really. Okay. And you have, what, three kids? Three kids. Yeah. Hallie, Madison, and Zach. So okay. they're nine, 11, and going to be 15 next month. Okay. Yep. That's that's a, a wide range there. I yeah. suppose that they keep you pretty busy. Yeah. Uh, it's absolutely off the walls. Uh, but look, they have the opportunities to engage in things that they love to do. And uh, that's our job to make sure they, they get there. So, it, you know, look... As, as tough as it is sometimes and as busy as it is, even though my wife's the one who does most of the work, it's uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. And I, I applaud you for saying that, <laughs> as most women would. Yeah. Um, so your dad, they keep you busy and you run, if I'm not mistaken, more than one, at least seven figure income businesses, correct? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. So there's a few, there's a few ongoing businesses. Um, you know, look everything from professional hair labs, which is the cosmetic uh, manufacturing side. Um, we do all types of private label contract manufacturing. Uh, there's also I have a, an electronics repair company called iFix. So we're an Apple certified company that uh, repairs tablets, uh, MacBooks, PCs, gaming consoles. And then I have my own consulting business where I help companies um, create their digital strategies. And uh, I find more so lately than you know before, it's, it's more about personal development because uh, I think in order to become the person to run your company, it starts with changes within yourself. And I, I think that's probably one of the biggest things people get caught up on nowadays is that they, uh, they struggle to be able to deal with the hard things themselves that form the part of them that allows them to run their company and grow it and look at it in the way it needs to be viewed in order for it to move forward. You know, I hit a roadblock just like that very recently and, and decided to start going to counseling because I was like, okay, something's broke and I need to fix it because I got to move forward because otherwise the business plan doesn't work. They all fit together. They do. And I think it all starts at the foundational level with yourself as a person. So mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, they, whenever you're having any type of trouble where it's, you know, business or whether it's personal, the first place you look is the personal side of things. Because what I've learned is that it's very rare that you see a business problem that doesn't lead back to a personal core. So once you fix that, it kind of takes care of itself. Refreshing to hear you say that. So you have a bit of a story how you got into the pro hair lab business. Do you not? Can, would you yeah. share? That? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, it's actually a familiar business. So uh, right now, today, uh, myself and my two brothers run the company. Uh, I'm the CEO. Uh, my brother, Daryl, is the president. And my brother, David, is the chief operating officer. It was owned by my father before that. And the company was actually started after um, my mother, who was a master hair technician, got chemical poisoning from the products that she was using over the years. Mm. So no matter how safe she used them in well-ventilated areas, the hair replacement industry was not regulated by any governing body. So the manufacturers who were supplying products into that industry could make products with you know really dangerous chemicals and carcinogens in them. And this led to uh, my mother getting chemical poisoning. She had to retire early and she never went really went back to it. So my dad sold the businesses, focused on creating a product line that was safe for technicians and safe for hair wearers. And in turn... <laughs> That kind of led to a change in the industry, a uh, different way of doing things. And over the years, uh, education was key in getting people to chance or, or try these new uh, application processes. And what we found is that 
I joined the company in 2009, and after reviewing everything that was going on, we decided to strip the company back, branding, messaging, uh, marketing, operations, and rebuild everything because it was it was hovering in you know mid to low or low six figures at that point. It was like 250, 270 thousand a year, and it fluctuated in between them for uh, geez, almost 15 years. And what happened at that point then was when we realized we had a really good product, the technology wasn't available to make it into what we wanted it or what we knew it could be. So fortunately, opportunities aligned quite well, and we were able to reformulate the product and give it the water and oil resistant properties that we needed to really make an impact. So that aligned really well with the relaunch of the company branding, the the messaging, and then our new marketing strategies, which were really simple at their core. And from there, it just year on year, it just kept growing and growing and growing. We built a team. Uh, we started an EU operation. Uh, we went. Uh, we tripled revenue within uh, eighteen months. That's impressive. Uh, when we launched that product, and then that kind of just led everything to grow into seven figures and then eight figures, and you know we're still on quite a, a heavy growth pattern at the moment. So um, even though the industry at the moment is quite unstable, peaks and valleys, but um, it's been a really interesting journey and a lot of lessons learned. So you said a, a couple of things that your growth was fueled by first some rebranding. Well, that may not be in this order. Rebranding, also reformulation. So yes, correct. Revisiting product. Your, your product, okay, and reformulating it. And then simplifying your marketing strategy as well as your brand. Yeah, I'm a huge believer in that the, the simplest solutions always make the greatest impacts. We as, we as humans, we tend to overcomplicate things and typically... <laughs> It typically just never ends well. Uh, so I'm a believer that, you know, always just look for the simple solutions because they they end up making the biggest impact, in my opinion. Give me an example of one of the things that you just like chopped down and you're like, this is it. And it works really well. Yeah. So um, in 2009, when I joined the company, so marketing and sales were always my background for many years before that. And we were looking at the different strategies. And, you know, at that time, I was really focused on digital and I was looking at, okay, look, you know, in our industry, there's not many of our competitors or people in the industry that are really focused on their e-commerce side of the site. We had one company who was operating in the same space and they were doing it really well, but they weren't one of our competitors. Actually, we, we were supplying them products. So we kind of looked at that strategy from an SEO perspective and we went all in on, on SEO. But the one other thing we did in conjunction with that, because look, SEO is a long-term game. We knew that if we did it now, we'd reap the benefits and we did, you know, uh, just a thousandfold. But one of the key things we did in conjunction with the SEO strategy that was more immediate is I spent three months building a manual database of every single hair replacement studio in the United States. So me, mm. yeah, it took me about three months. Uh, so I knew I knew the list intimately at that point because I was manually entering it myself. And we did a direct mail campaign, really simple postcard, front and back. Uh, front was the product, the benefits. The back was the um, was the testimonials from key industry leaders, and um, we sent it out. I think there was about five thousand in total. We sent it out in three batches because we had a small team. We didn't want to inundate the phone lines where we couldn't keep up. Mm -hmm. So we sent it out in three batches, and again within the eighteen months, we tripled revenue. And what happened was we were getting studios calling and saying, "I'll order a bottle to try it." That one bottle order next order might be five or it might be 10 or it might be 25. And it just started to compound. And then what we realized is that there was little touch up bottles that were needed by the studios. We made a smaller bottle, put it into the studios on the shelf sales. We then built some good distribution channels and wholesale channels. And before you know it, it just, mm -hmm. our product started to revolutionize the industry because it was a water-based solution and not a solvent-based solution. So those, the, from a marketing perspective, those two, the direct mail marketing, which is something that was immediate and the SEO, they compounded over time to, you know, make a powerhouse of a simple marketing strategy. You know, what's interesting is that people buy lists all the time and those lists are super not targeted and random and very inaccurate. I've even done it. Okay. Just to yeah. be honest. No, no. Look, we, I still get pitched every week with yeah. people lists. And for me, I, you know, look, I, I, I just won't do it because unless I, what we do is we train internally to, to build lists because we know exactly what we're looking for. So we don't want this big list of, you know, a hundred thousand people. We we'd rather a list of ten thousand people that are very targeted. So smart, very smart. So you went to hair studios and salons. So that brings me to the other part of your strategy with your products. You do what's called private label, correct? Yes. Okay. Can you explain what that means? Sure. So 
we have our products, which are tried and tested, and we know they work. We built the, the solutions over a period of time. And for people that are looking to uh, make an easy entry into the marketplace and etch their own path, this is a simple way where they can come in and say, hey, listen, I love this particular product you have. Can I put my label on it? Absolutely. And uh, what that does is that when we do our mass production runs, we can leave a percentage of those unlabeled and on the shelf. So as long as we get sent their labels, we can store them and apply them as they need them and they go out. So it's a really cost effective way for them to launch their brand rather than having to commit to a thousand or two thousand or three thousand or ten thousand units. Mm -hmm. So um, that that was a huge part of our business for some time. But what happened was um, as time went on, people were realizing the e-commerce space was much bigger or sorry, much more accessible in the cosmetic industry. So they started to really take the private label options that we had and they went to a custom formula package. And that basically allowed us to take it into our lab and reformulate the whole product very meticulously to their spec. The product would then stand out for them. You wouldn't have people picking up a product off the shelf and be like, oh, you know what? That smells like a professional hair labs product, or this looks like a professional hair labs product. It was a much better way for them to do it. And when they were able to validate the product in their marketplace and build their audience, it made more sense for them to do that. It was really just a natural progression of change over time. Okay. And do you sell directly to the consumers? No, we have a direct to consumer. Sorry. Yes, we do. <laughs> but not. it's not part of our strategy. We're only doing it to combat the counterfeits that are in the marketplace of our brand. Uh, uh, so if somebody doesn't know where to buy, um, we have a direct to consumer marketplace uh, online that that they can just buy the products and they know what they're getting is legitimate. Um, but if we have customers in certain areas, say the United States, for example, who ask if we have distributors in the area, wholesalers in the area, we'll point them in that direction. So you, you just mentioned something. So a lot of business owners out there, you know, they're doing, you know, e-commerce, they may have come up with an original idea like you guys have. And then you all of a sudden products that look like yours, maybe a slight spelling difference, or, you know, the label looks exactly like yours show up on Amazon. How do you, oh, they, how do you combat that? With a lot of resource and a lot of money, um, you know, they, they, they didn't even try to do that. They just went straight in and, and just knocked off the whole product. Labels oh. were identical. Uh, product was not identical. And the only way I can explain it is that we're not dealing with a, you know, a purse or a handbag or a piece of clothing. You know, this is a cosmetic product going on the skin. And when you're getting, mm -hmm. uh, you're getting um, complaints of people getting their, you know, their skin being burnt and you're, you, you know, this goes against everything you've built the company on. Right. Uh, it's a big challenge. So, you know, every year uh, we have a very heavy outlay. We have AI technology that monitors, you know, the the online space, which can remove counterfeits in different uh, countries because we have our trademarks and our IP very well protected. It doesn't stop the underground distribution channel uh, penetration that happens. That's something we have uh, investigators on the ground in a lot of different countries that go in, complete test buys and brick and mortar stores. And then we kind of trace it back to the, the guilty parties and we, we take action we need to take then because, look, I mean, this is, I mean, as of today, it's probably costing us in lost sales over $6 million a year, just on a couple of products. Holy cow. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's serious business. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it makes it lucrative for the counterfeiters as well. So yeah. it, it's one of those things where every year it gets worse and we're able to monitor this because we know what our growth patterns are. They're predictable now at this point. Mm -hmm. And we know that when we hit certain points of resistance in the marketplace, we know it's because of counterfeits. We're either trying to enter a country where counterfeits have already entered a year previously and people are questioning, well, why is your product so much more expensive? And when we find out what they're purchasing, mm -hmm. we realize they're not legitimate products. Uh, so it's it, it's a tough space to navigate. But uh, look, we've got a good legal team. We know the process is internally inside out. And, you know, look, it's eventually we will um, we'll get to a point where it makes it extremely difficult for counterfeiters to get away with what, the, what they're doing. Well, that could be a whole podcast by itself. Oh, <laughs> oh absolutely. My gosh. <laughs> yeah. um, but I want to backtrack just a little bit. So you sure. talked about the formulation and the same or safer formulation and how it I, I believe you said some regulations changed. Is that not correct? Yeah, look, regulations change all the time. Um, you know, we decided sure. years ago to base our principal development and manufacturing facility in Ireland because EU regulations are much more stringent than U.S. regulations. Yeah, uh, sure. For example, there's 90 ingredients in the U.S. that are banned where there's over 300 in the EU. Mm -hmm. So we follow 
those guidelines and we're producing here with the right ISO certs, it's looked upon very favorably, you know, globally. Uh, so if we develop a product here, which we do, um, we're fairly sure that no matter where we need to ship it in the world, it's already pretty much cleared. So mm -hmm. it's a good way to, to make sure that you're creating premium products, you know, uh, in line with the regulations. So yeah, that's, I mean, that that's really, from that perspective, that's really about it on, on, on the formulation side. It's, it's just, you need to, as a cosmetic manufacturer, you always have to look at how you can put out the most compliant product you can, because ultimately, if you make something for somebody and there's an ingredient that's not compliant, that whole batch is gone. You can lose hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, so mm -hmm. it's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. So what is the range of products that you produce? So we started in the non-surgical hair replacement side. So it was cosmetic bonding adhesives to apply the wigs to the scalp. We did shampoos, scalp treatments, um, conditioners, shampoos. Then it moved into a wider range of cosmetics. So we do hair care, skin care, body care, self-tanning, sanitizers. You know, we, we can even do foundations, lip gloss, those sort of things. Anything that, that doesn't uh, require the creation of powder. Uh, so if it's a cosmetic, we can essentially do it for the most part. Okay. What has been the biggest challenge in growing your business this big? I think, so it, it's in different phases. So when we were mid to high six-figure business, it was about the um, relationships mm -hmm. with people because they, they were the people you had the time to speak with on a daily basis. When we had seven figures, it became about processes and systems internally. Mm -hmm. And eventually, when we moved up into the high uh, seven figures and over the eight figure mark, it became about leadership and it became about uh, the executive team being the people that they needed to be to make sure that they were instilling the right culture into the company and making sure that the leadership team that was in charge of managing the company was doing it the way that we envisioned for the company. So, look, I mean, one thing myself and my brothers are quite good at is we're quite empathetic people. So we're, we're able to put ourselves in the position of, of another to, you know, look at certain situations. And it doesn't matter whether it's 30 seconds or an hour, you, you put yourself in there to, to look at the situation. But I think that has enabled us to, to inspire and, and to basically uh, train people. This is the way we want to do things. And, and for a lot of people that came into the company, one in particular, so uh, our, our operations manager in Europe, he, he came from the freight and logistics environment before he was working with us. And he said it took him about a year and a half to figure out why it was such a great place to work when he came here because he was so conditioned to go in with a shield and with the armor on him on a daily basis to deal with what was on his workload. And when he came and joined themselves, uh, it was a complete game changer for him. And, you know, he says he, you know, he, he loves coming into work and he he bends over backwards to make sure everything is done right and the way it should be. And he takes pride in what he does. But ultimately, without that sort of view of the company by the team, I find it very difficult to see how you won't have a high turnover of, of staff and ultimately a loss in resources, a loss of time, a loss of uh, revenue. revenue. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. Because it takes time to train and, you know, yeah. that, 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 costs that money. money to hire and exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, you know, that that's where I think is we went past the eight figure mark. It was really about, um, it was about leadership and, and developing as individuals. And I think that's been harder than any growth, you know, monetary growth inside of the company. You can fix systems or you can hire consultants to help you fix systems or teach you. But when it comes to personal development, it's one of those things where if you give your ear to the wrong person, it could set you back years. Mm -hmm. So it's vitally important. You have to be selective about who you're lending your ears to because it's that they're the ones that are going to influence you to think a certain way to be able to overcome the hurdles or the, the barriers you put in front of yourself. Good, strong mentors is what I just took from that. A hundred percent. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. And show me, show me anyone that has achieved any level of success, whether it be personal or professional, that doesn't have a mentor. And I, I'd be shocked because how else are you supposed to learn? You can't, you can't always learn by making the mistakes all the time because it will slow down progress dramatically. Yeah. Having somebody who's been there and done it and can impart their wisdom can fast track to you if you listen. <laughs> yeah. If you listen and you're willing to address the things that need to be addressed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I agree. So how many different countries are you in for the pro hair labs? I don't know exactly off the top of my head, but in most of them, I mean, we're, you know, all, all pretty much every country in Europe, United States, Canada, Mexico, South America, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, 
there's the, our brand is in most most countries, you know. And uh, look, we're we're trying to improve those relationships and 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 those distribution channels, and that's where we're focused at the moment. Because right now, we're trying to maximize our most popular lines, so we can build the pathways for the new products we're launching into the marketplaces, which over the next year is going to be huge. You know, we we have eighty new products this year alone that are that are in the pipeline, and by the end of twenty twenty four, we aim to have three hundred. So. It's it's a quite aggressive expansion plan. Um, we've invested heavily in our in our operations. We've brought our U.S. warehouse, our distribution and office space in Florida. We're doubling that from seventeen and a half thousand square feet, and we're we're building another building just beside it of the same size in Europe, where I am here. We have a ten thousand square foot manufacturing facility, but we've just acquired a seventy thousand square foot, fifty of which is going to be production and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge jump. So it's just about making the decision to reinvest to future proof your growth, because with those sort of changes, you want to make sure that you're, you're looking at least 10 years out. Absolutely. Absolutely. How can people find you and your products after the show? Everywhere online. I mean, Amazon, eBay, uh, our website, there's plenty of different portals that you'd find our products. Uh, if you want to reach out to us, we're on all major social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn's my my hangout. So uh, me personally, that's where you'll find me. But yeah, look, I mean, it's a, we have a lot of different touch points. So um, if you just search professional hair labs or ghost bond online, you'll come across something. I mean, even on Amazon, we have the number one selling product in the category. So that's something we worked for for many years. And uh, it, it's it's proving quite impactful because... Uh, people know that they can go to that platform and that's where they're going to get a legitimate product from because we're part of their uh, counterfeit transparency program. Awesome. So all of the information, your LinkedIn and all of that will be in the show notes. One cool. last question, and you might not be able to answer this. Okay. Can you give us any sneak peeks of the new products to come? Oh, absolutely. So we're working on, um, we're experimenting with a lot of innovative uh, cosmetic products. For example, one of them is um, is a moisturizer with snail secretion. So the reason snail secretion is because it's quite a impervious barrier. So when you when you treat your skin and then you apply this moisturizer, it puts a barrier over your skin to protect it from the elements. So it's great for colder countries, and it smells it like you know we we obviously fragrance it and it smells great. Um, we're also experimenting with a with a moisturizer that has a bee poison, and the reason we're doing that is because bee poison will give a Botox effect. And there's only two or three places in the world that ethically are able to extract a poison from bees because naturally if bees stings you and that's it, it dies. But this uh, the, this specific method that they use to extract the poison is they have uh, they have very slightly low voltage low voltage electrical sheets, and it just entices the the extraction of a very small amount of it, and that obviously adds up. Now it's a highly expensive product; it's a premium product. But we're probably about six months from having that, uh, you know, complete launch to market. So those are some of the innovations. But then you talk about some of the just the the clinical stuff, you know, so uh, repair gel for the skin. If you have damaged skin, this particular cream you apply to your skin on a daily basis and over 30 days, it repairs the skin cells on, on your hands, on your face, on your arms, wherever you apply it. So um, those are the, those are some of the products we're working on. And then you have your standard ones like self tanning or you're talking body washes or, um, you know, lip gloss, just all the standard cosmetics. So you're going to see a huge expansion through our principal manufacturing company, which is called Scientific Cosmetics. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be the company where B2B companies can come in, uh, say, listen, I'm looking for this type of product and we already have it stabilized and tested on the shelf, ready to go. We can make small adjustments to it without having to retest everything. And we can then take the process of custom formulation and uh, product launch from 16 weeks, literally down to four weeks. So it's a very quick way for big, big businesses to, uh, to, to come in and get, you know, quick products in the quantities they need. That's incredible. I really appreciate you being here today. I love the story of how you've grown your company and the challenges that you face. I appreciate you being transparent about all of that. Uh, no, no, no problem at all, Denise. I, I appreciate you having me and it's great to you know, be able to have that conversation. Thank you for joining me for today's Nurture Small Business podcast, where the focus is on business growth, technology, and people strategies to help your business thrive. At DCA Virtual Business Support, our focus is making your business operations run smooth so you can focus on growth. Reach out to me at denise at dcavirtual.com 
if you'd like to learn more. 